Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you for coming. Last week uh, we had a lecture on uh, apologizing and how a person should do it. What's the correct way to do it? So we're going to talk about today. It's not apologizing to person, but to apologizing to God. Uh, I guess it goes under the heading of tshuva of repentance, but it's basically apologizing. You've done something wrong, and now you're asking God to forgive you, much like you would do to a person. So how do we see that different? apologizing to a person, to God than to a person. And really there's a, there's a major difference between an apology to God and an apology to man. The truth of the matter is, you apologize to someone. A, they may not want to f accept your apology. They may do so begrudgingly. They may feel pressured to do so because they know they kind of have to. It doesn't look good if they don't. But they really bear some resentment. And Every time they may think of you or do something with you, in the back of their mind, there's still that incident that happened, especially if it was grievous. And that's where there's a distinction between God and people. Probably the most grievous sin that the nation of Israel had committed was making the golden calf. Forty days after receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai, Jewish nations were at the pinnacle of their existence closeness to God. In fact, death was taken out of the world. They become immortal. They were really on the level of angels. And now they make the golden calf. Probably the most grievous thing they could have done. And the commentaries say, as we know, it's one of the six remembrances that we say every day, that God always remembers it. So there are different opinions, but the altar of Kelm says, what does it mean that God always remembers it? And the answer that he gives is that whenever we sin, no matter how grievous it is, that God always remembers the sin of the golden calf. Why? Because he thinks to himself, you know, if I could have forgiven them for that sin, I can forgive them for anything. Because in reality, when we deal with God, God is a creator and he's a king. But most of all, God is our father. In fact, the greatest prayer that we have, that which we turn to in moments of great need, is Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King. And it begins with Father. In fact, in the blessing that we say for forgiveness in the standing prayer in the Shemona Esrei, we say, Salach lanu avinu ki chatanu. We ask God to forgive us, our Father, because we have sinned. And then we say, Machal lanu malkenu ki fashanu. And then we ask for to be pardoned from the King. Because in reality, a king only pardons. Pardoning means this, this, the grievance, the sin still exists, but the, king, but the king's pardoned you. Forgiveness, on the other hand, means that the slate is wiped clean. And that's the distinction. That when we pray to God, we first, we don't pray to him as our king or our father, or pardon me, our king, because it's not a complete forgiveness. What we say is, listen, we understand. We have sinned, and it may be even grievous. But you're our father. And be because you're our father, that is something you should understand. And the forgiveness that can be given. And what do we, what do, what do we say where God's concerned? Chanun hamar belisloach. That he, it, really he wants to forgive. It's not that he does forgive. forgive. He waits and anticipates the fact that you're going to ask him for forgiveness. In fact, on Yom Kippur, it's really called Yom HaKippurim. Not, not singular. The Day of Atonement. Why plural? Because there's two ways that a person can apologize to God, if you will. One, out of fear. You don't want to be punished. But the other, out of love. Like disappointing a parent. And knowing how much it hurts them. I remember with my mother, when we would see her disappointment, we would ask her to beat us. It was so much easier. Because that you can get over. Watching the disappointment on your mother's face is more than most of us can bear. So it's the same thing with God Almighty. Turning to a parent. And if you do tshuva mi'ava, if you do repentance from love, the amazing thing is, not only is the sin forgiven, but somehow miraculously, that sin becomes a good deed. Something that is over and above this world. In this world, no matter how much you repent doing something bad to anyone, it's never going to be a good deed. It's still a sin. You may have been forgiven for it and it's overlooked, 
but it's still there. The mark's never taken away. You can erase it, but you'll still see it. But with God, just the opposite. Not only, so sometimes there are stories told of people who, had lead, who have led very evil lives, sensuous lives, doing things that were directly against the will of God. And yet, moments before they die, they do tshuva, out of ava, out of love, realizing what they've done. And the heavenly voice is called out. These people are being accepted into the world to come in a very high place. In fact, with one, Rebbe Lez Ben Jastoy, he wasn't a rabbi, and the, and the boss call called him Rebbe. And Rebbe Hudan Nasi, one of the greatest individuals that ever lived, the one who edited the Mishnah, the first of the oral tradition, when he heard this, he began to cry. And he said, I take a whole lifetime to get together what this man has done in the last minute of his life. And that why? Because it's a father. And God is a father. In fact, it's interesting that he created us, the Torah tells us, Ram min Arav, evil from birth. He created us imperfect. Why? And the answer is that he gave, put us into this world with challenges for us to strive for perfection. Not necessarily to reach it, but it's the effort that God put us into this world for, to attempt to do it. Why? For the same thing that every parent wants. Again, we are a reflection of God Almighty. Every parent wants to be relevant. It makes no difference how old the child or how young the child. The parent wants to think that that child looks to him for support, for advice, for love, for forgiveness. And a parent and a child knows. In fact, I remember when my mother she rest in peace, passed away. I cried bitterly because no one will ever love me that way. If I would have killed somebody, somehow that person was at fault for being in the way of the bullet. <laughs> there would be no way in the world that I could have done anything wrong. It's an amazing type of relationship. But that's the relationship we have with God Almighty. That same thing. And he creates us evil from birth because he makes us realize that without his assistance, without his love, without his guidance, without the instruction manual that he gave us, the truth of him is we can never find true happiness, true joy, true contentment. And that great love between him, God and between ourselves that exists, that he yearns for, and the part within us also yearns for, just like a parent loves a child, so too is that, that connection between God Almighty and ourselves. It's interesting that there's also a major difference. We can deal with the sins that we do with God when we ask that we apologize. We mentioned last week the three R's. The three R's of apologizing. First, regret, responsibility, and remedy. So to a person, all of these have to be absolute. Because if they're not absolute, then the person is really not going to forgive you. And if they've forgiven you once, they're not going to forgive you a second time. It has to be absolute. But not with God Almighty. There was a rabbi who used to give lectures named Rabbi Miller. And he said on one of his tapes something that was very eye-opening. He said that if you have a person who finds they have to work on Shabbat, what if they walk to work? They're still going to work. They're going to be Mechal Shabbos. They're going to desecrate the Shabbos. But because it's Shabbat, what this person says is, you know what? I'm not going to take my car. I'm going to walk to work. That's a big deal. But he's still Mechal Shabbos. But it's a big deal. What if a person's a smoker? And he said that the person takes out, a, opens up a new pack of cigarettes, takes out one cigarette, puts it on the side and says, because it's Shabbat, I'm not going to smoke that cigarette. Where normally I would smoke 20, I'm only going to smoke 19. He said, that's a big deal. Because he's changing something. He's doing something. He's acknowledging the fact that there is a God in this world. That he has a father. And that it bothers him that he's not doing and not showing his father the proper reverence. Not following what his father would like. So even though it's imperfect, but it still shows an action. It still shows a desire. And it's interesting, the evil side, the Yetzirah, 
he doesn't get us to rob a bank. What he gets us to do is steal a penny. And then we rob the bank in a process of those things that we thought were bad at one point almost become mitzvahs. And we just don't see them as so evil as they were in the beginning. There are many things as in our lives that at one point in our lives we thought things were disgusting. People, how could people do this? <laughs> and then we're leading the charge. And all of a sudden we've changed our whole attitude because the side of evil desensitizes us to these things. So with God, it doesn't have to be perfect. God has perfection. He has angels. What does he need us for? For an imperfect human being to serve him. That's the key. If you have two sons, and the best example is the Torah. Yaakov and Esav. This righteous couple, Yitzchak, Isaac and Rebekah, Rivka, had two children, twins. Twins. One was righteous, one was evil. Did they do anything different? Did they love them any different? Did they bring them up any different? Of course not. These were righteous individuals. And yet one was righteous, Yaakov, and one was evil, Esau. And the amazing thing is Yitzchak is considered to be the true father of Israel. And why? Because this man who was considered to be the most severe, the most difficult, the, most, the hardest of all the forefathers, a no-nonsense man, put up with his son Esau. Because he understood that Yaakov, his son, who was a superstar, who became the third of the fathers, who was the father of all the twelve tribes, he would have been Yaakov to any father. He wasn't Yaakov because he was Yitzchak's son. He was born special. And he used that gift that he had and, and worked on himself. So Yitzchak's true success as a person, as a father, was not Yaakov. Amazingly, it was Esau. That by virtue of Yitzchak putting up and working on, a, on an Esau that he should have thrown away. Because who wants a son like that? He's not going to honor me in any way. I'm not going to have, I'm not gonna have uh, any, any real nachas, any real benefit, any real joy from this child. He kept him close. So much so that the wives that Esau had burned incense to idols in his house that blinded him. He still kept them then. Because he understood what would define Yitzchak, the father, is the son. The son that he worked on. And even though Esau may still have been a Russia, but meanwhile we learn out the mitzvah of honoring parents from Esau. That whatever Esau was, he showed respect to his father. He honored his father. He was a better person because of his father. He didn't kill his, his brother Yaakov, who he wanted to kill for taking the blessings because of his father. So what defines Yitzchak is not Yaakov. It's Esau. That little bit better. You know, in the Olympics, the person that wins, it's one hundredth of a section. That's it, one hundredth of a second. You can't even say it. Someone that just reaches out a little bit more. And that's what life's about, little things. You know, we all try to hit that grand slam. We all try to make that, that big score. But it's really those small things that define us. It's also the small things that sink the ship. And Yitzhak understood that. So when we apologize to God, it's not saying, and even though we should think about totally stopping the sin, but what it really means is we're asking him, give me time to be better. Help me to get the strength to be able to do what I need to do. You know who I am. And when you throw yourself on the compassion of your father, just the fact that you're talking to him, just the fact that you acknowledge him, just the fact that you know there's a God in the world, gives him joy. Does that mean that you abuse it? We do. But it means that we really shouldn't. Imagine if you had a friend and he had a son that was just awful. But he kept treating him with the greatest amount of love and affection and gifts. You would feel sorry for him. And that's our relationship with God. You want to be good? Apologize to God and be a better son just because he's a great father. May God bless us all that we have strength to do so. Thank you for coming. God bless and have a good Shabbat.